I'd like to first uh, thank our speakers uh, for their propagations this morning. Um, crisis? What crisis? Um, I wonder if we might reflect, uh, firstly, on uh, the ways in which uh, the kinds of lens, the, the lens and perspective defined or bracketed by some of the terms that have been introduced, whether it be networked ecologies or new geographies, um, are transforming uh, design thinking. Uh, and I'm thinking of a, a range of, say, historic juxtapositions that were made in the talks this morning. Uh, resistance versus adaptation, design versus management, um, the prescriptive versus the performative, uh, fixity versus multiplicity. And I think, because you, you introduced some of these conditions at the end of your talk as well, uh, the nature city uh, 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 opposition versus the notion of a constructed ecology or constructed system, uh, projection versus a feedback loop, uh, jurisdictional boundary versus new flows of governance. Uh, and ask uh, in these kind of conditions that are being recognized on the one hand by each of the speakers, um, what is the agency of design to operate in these fields? Where does its agency reside? I just told you that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, in the, in the one way, I'm thinking about more operational descriptions, yeah. perhaps, because the, 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 the I think the open-ended issues that um, you were describing and alluding to have been ones that have been central to a range of discussions across yeah, um, both landscape, architecture, and urbanism for, for the last um, near decade. Would you mind provoking it again? Then? Ed, you, you look well, like you actually I, I, want to start out here. Yes, I, I'm the non-architect, uh, maybe anti-architect. Um, <laughs> so I might as well try to comment on this. Uh, Again, from the perspective that I have, one of the things that we're seeing is the intensification in the production of unjust geographies. This is something I'm currently working on. Uh, and in response to these unjust geographies and other features of this regional urbanization process that I'm talking about, uh, a new kind of politics has been emerging. New kinds of social movements have been emerging, uh, having to do with uh, uh, justice, kind of seeking justice, trying to erase the injustices that have been uh, increasing. Uh, and uh, this new cultural politics is, is also um, making uh, it more ne necessary to have some coalition building taking place. And so after that pre preface, uh, I, I think the future for architects and designers uh, are going to be to, to, to take their particular skills into these new coalitions that are emerging, labor, community, ethnic, cultural, religious coalitions, grassroots coalitions that are emerging uh, in, in the search for social justice uh, in its broadest sense. Uh, and to realize that uh, you know, architecture and design, uh, designing at the micro scale is uh, often producing unjust spaces, uh, oppressive kinds of spaces, spaces that have negative effects uh, might increase uh, uh, masculinist domination, a class domination, you know, it could be anything. Uh, when you sit down and, 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 and you, you draw, you're not necessarily doing something innocent or individually creative, uh, but that it is something that's going to be shaping the spaces around you, sometimes in very bad ways. Uh, and so I think this, this uh, uh, again, thinking in this more geographical way at multiple scales uh, is going to be important for the architect and designer to uh, join into some of these uh, larger scale processes. Alone, I, and, and I think everyone, no, there are, are there any architects that really think that they can do this alone? Uh, build cities alone? I don't think so, but uh, I hope not. Well, let me, uh, let me uh, is this microphone? Yeah, microphone's on. I mean, first of all, this is, this is a panel on the environment, ecology, um, things that normally escape uh, the grasp of, uh, let's say, urbanism conferences. So I'd like to try to reel that back in a little bit and talk uh, toward, I would say, uh, maybe non-social justice issues. I mean, look, I, I teach in a planning school where it's in your face. Social justice is a critically important thing. Um, and 
it's out there. There are a lot of people working on it. There are not a lot of planners, in my opinion. There are not a lot of architects that are actually grappling with the real issues of the ecological problems. There aren't a lot of Chris Reeds out there. I mean, there's very few people that really understand the scientific dimensions of this work. Just to give you a, a, an example, as a kind of way to bridge the question from Jeffrey about the agency of how you operate in this arena, um, what I've discovered uh, through this, you know, what I call the interstitial knowledge gap, the sort of working between disciplines, um, you know, and I would say the thing that happens quite often is, you know, we get up and we say everyone needs to think like us. We, we all need to think like geographers, or we all need to think like architects, or I, I think the, re the reality is we all have to get outside of ourselves and start looking at the problems that are out there. The problem I have with the way that planners and geographers operate, and look, and I'm, I'm a landscape architect and urban designer that does geography, is that we work with data that's in the past. We measure with things that aren't on the ground. We're always working behind the curve. Um, and that's truly the, I think, the, the place of agency where designers can interact the best, is to work on the agency between the past and the present, and perhaps even the future. One example of this is, um, and I'll end so other people can talk, is that how I work with engineers. Engineers are constantly talking about removing natural process to make more efficiency. Landscape architects work toward adding natural process to make things less efficient. There's a huge gap there. There's a huge gap. Nobody's talking about this. We brought it up at a breakfast uh, session with the, with the uh, ad, uh, administrative, the academic council at MIT. And Susan Hockfield, the president of, of MIT, um, very explicitly said we need to fund language gap uh, uh, operations here. We need the engineers to learn how to speak with other people, and we need other people to speak. That's a place where I think we can make a big difference in the agency of the environment and urbanism. I think in part what that suggests <clears throat> is that uh, architects, landscape architects, urbanists, um, become uh, very nimble players uh, in the making of the city, that they're not just uh, looking at the very detailed design aspects of a particular building or a particular place, but they're starting to be uh, the people who are making these uh, connections across disciplines. And because, in particular with landscape architects, it's my training, um, the way that we are trained to deal with natural systems, engineered systems, uh, systems at very large scales, systems at very small scales, there's a way that we can kind of move back and forth in and among these discussions, uh, I think, to help inform um, um, them better, to help uh, uh, bridge some of these language gaps. But it, it, it doesn't mean that we become uh, experts necessarily on uh, the horticultural plant communities of um, uh, you know, Eastern Michigan, it means that we're operating at a level across disciplines, understanding things uh, in relationship to one another, understanding environmental systems and uh, understanding politics, understanding urban systems, and, and negotiating among all those um, uh, factors uh, in order to uh, project uh, uh, how to frame or reframe uh, uh, the urban project. <clears throat> okay, now that I've got something to react to besides myself, uh, I, I think that, that uh, I'd like to actually go, go back to what uh, Ed said and then uh, and tie it into some of the other things. I think that actually you're, you're right that social justice is a, is a key issue and something that architects shouldn't forget about and it's, um, and, and we shouldn't ignore it because it's, it's, it's crucial, right? I mean, it's like, a, I think, you know, for society. But um, at the same, and, and uh, at the same time, that was also why I was bringing in the political regulation, you know, into my discussion of saying that, you know, this is a form, a certain form of ecology, if you will. If you think of humans as part of whatever these kind of hybrid cyborgs are, how are, you know, how do we react to each other? How do we as a species behave? And, you know, that, those are very, you know, social justice is really key to that. Um, 
And I, if you were asking me very concretely about sort of things that might uh, happen then, although, um, well, for example, you know, if you were going to be looking at the LA River, um, you know, the, the kind of plans that are, that are typically done, let's just use that as an example, uh, to, uh, to think about what its future might be would be to, you know, imagine it as a park for the whole city, uh, imagine it as, as being something to be brought back to some natural condition, something that, that by no means can happen um, because of the change, the fact that the whole city has changed uh, physically. But at the same time, one might ask, you know, if you, if you were uh, in a kind of, let's say, some kind of broader ecological perspective that considered uh, social justice as part of it, uh, you know, how is it being used by the surrounding community, uh, and which in many cases is very poor? Um, as, and, uh, you know, does, is this something we ignore, you know, as uh, in thinking of uh, the city as, uh, you know, a kind of place uh, full of design or urbanism, or is it something that is, is key and part of it? Uh, the other thing, uh, bringing into that is that, that social justice questions are very, especially in LA, more, probably more than most cities, are environmental justice issues. Uh, and uh, in LA, for example, you know, you can live, if you live in Venice, where it costs, uh, you know, just a huge amount of money to live, you can, it can be uh, temperate all year round. You can breathe, you can look at, more importantly, you can look at the uh, pollution there, and you'll find that the pollution is, in fact, very low. And then if you go, as a further inland you go, and the further you go into poverty, uh, you find that, that not only does it become less less temperate and, uh, in fact, quite often to quite large climate extremes, but it also becomes extremely polluted to the point that it becomes very hazardous uh, for, uh, to human health. And I think that, that, that those kind of uh, issues on a regional planning uh, scale are crucial. And, you know, as in many cases, center cities are improving their environmental qualities as other places in, in um, what was formerly known as suburbia are, are decreasing as those places uh, are becoming uh, homes for uh, immigrants and for the poor. Uh, so I think those issues are key, and they, they, they can and should be written into uh, a broader kind of ecological thinking uh, and design. Um, finally, just to say that in terms of, let's say, how one might bring in uh, for uh, these issues in uh, into design very specifically. Again, as, as a researcher, I'm not going to point to my work, but rather to, uh, both on the one hand, the Center for Urban Pedagogy and what uh, Damon Rich is trying to do now as the urban designer of new work, I think is really interesting and worth watching. Um, and then on the other hand, I, I would say, um, in terms of maybe not quite social justice, but in terms of, of thinking about uh, these uh, hybrid ecologies of humans, regulations, and economies. Uh, the one, the only essay that I allowed any design in in the infrastructural city, because I wanted it to be like Banham's book, a, a kind of a project of research. Design is for other projects I'm doing. Um, the only essay I allowed that was was Roger Sher that would that involved actually sort of more traditional design thing was Roger Sherman's, which looked at property rights and negotiations as being something that um, could be things that architects could hack into. And he used some models of how people themselves, you know, did things. Like a guy in his backyard created a, his backyard was at an odd shape. He talked to his neighbor. They created a regulation-sized wiffle ball lot that eventually has bleachers uh, and, uh, and so forth. He's obviously not, an, not a uh, poor person. But he thought about, you know, he thought about uh, these questions of uh, regulations, uh, politics, uh, and figured out ways to hack through it. And I think that, again, that kind of situational awareness of any situation and all of its dimensions, I think, is, is crucial, a huge challenge, but it's, it's what, what we do, I think, as you know, architects. I wonder if we might uh, return to uh, the seemingly self-evident statement you made regarding the kind of disbelief in the heroic figure having the capacity to design a to totalizing vision in the context of the issues that Alan raises regarding interdisciplinary language and the capacity to speak across disciplines. Um, specifically, I'm curious in the context of this discussion, uh, if we might talk a bit about the ways in which uh, new pedagogic practices, or rather what forms of new pedagogic practices may need to emerge at this moment to address the complexity that we're talking about. Um, uh, and I'd, I'd like to actually preface that in the context of questioning simply the titling of the operation as, say, being trans or interdisciplinarity uh, driven. Um, rather, what specific set of tools or mechanisms uh, for working, learning, uh, and new modes of collaboration must start to emerge from within uh, educational institutions at this moment to address the complexity that each of you addressed it in the discussions you presented earlier. Well, I, I mean, I'll just add a, 
couple of brief words on that because I think um, this is truly, uh, you know, the essence of the problem. I see it every day. Um, it, first of all, architecture left to itself will try to cannibalize all of us mm -hmm. uh, and not do much of it that well, honestly. I, I, I go to reviews now and architects aren't by and large, nobody's actually making buildings anymore. I mean, so, I, you know, what happened to making buildings? Why, why aren't architects designing buildings anymore? I mean, they're doing more landscape that I can see than landscape yeah, architects are even doing. Um, but the, the, I think, you know, the essence of this is, you know, the way that we operate, and this is not everyone's example, but it's a good example, I think, is that we do the research. You know, I mean, look, we're uh, very fortunate. We, we're we're well-funded. We're in a good place, uh, academic institution. Uh, everyone can't have this situation. But the work is framed wrong most of the time. That's the real problem. The projects come to firms who wait around for the RFPs. Everyone scatters around. They all jump out. And they all send their stuff in. And everyone's got their little disciplinary silo. The work is framed that way from the beginning. And I think, really, if, if we teach designers to do more synthetic research, with other disciplinary uh, attitudes, meaning geographers have to be in the mix. Scientists have to be in the mix. Uh, the rhetoric has to go away, and we all just have to work hard at this. The research will generate the kind of work we ought to be doing, and it will be a bottom-up process that then says, here's where we should be focusing our limited resources, rather than let the project tell us how to behave. So the model's got to be inverted somehow, at least temporarily, to see what happens, ex experimentally to see what happens. I mean, it's working for us. Uh, I know that. But the research reframes everything. The project gets redefined. It gets invented from the, the, the research, not the other way around. And that's a critical point. Um, the, 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 the idea that even, even when you are reacting to um, a client's program or a site or, or whatever, that, that, that part of your project is to throw open um, uh, those conditions um, and to start, start from scratch and try to figure out what the project is at its core, what the program needs to be, who the stakeholders are, who the, the multiple set of clients uh, uh, and constituents are to be engaged. Um, and so you're building the project, you're conceiving the project, even in the context um, uh, like I am in practice sometimes, where uh, that brief has been given to us. We're, we're oftentimes, the first thing we're doing is rewriting that brief. Um, in design studios, the question becomes, what do you do and how do you engage and, and what is it that you're studying? And, and for us, it's as much about understanding the situational aspects of, of the place, which include the politics. So the example that Kazis has given about Roger and, and negotiation tactics within the context of Los Angeles is particularly appropriate to that place because it's under the radar. There aren't really planning frameworks. You couldn't go propose a plan for such a thing. I mean, you just, you just work uh, in and around and with um, the currents that are in play. And so, Part of what we need to train are people who are perceptive, perceptive enough to go into these environments to really assess the conditions on the ground, assess the politics, assess the players, and formulate the project from there. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, respond to the, the, the threat of disciplinary silos when I'm talking about thinking geographically. Um, uh, I don't know of many geographers who are thinking geographically the way I'm talking about it, uh, that it has to do with thinking spatially. Uh, and thinking spatially is by its very nature interdisciplinary, uh, particularly when we see the relationship between space and time. Uh, and that we have for the last hundred years accepted an historical perspective as a form of cross-disciplinary thinking. And uh, every architecture, pro good architecture program and design program I know has a course on theory, history, and criticism. Uh, now, this is a spatial discipline. Where's the space? Why isn't it theory, history, geography, and 
criticism, uh, space-time, uh, mixing them together. This is one of the, the arguments I'm making, that we need to, 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 to have a very different view of space and geography than architects, designers, planners, and, and uh, um, geographers, too, have in, in their traditional sense. Uh, it's a much broader, much more wider in scope uh, a kind of concept of uh, critical spatial thinking. And so that was partly what I was trying, trying to encourage and, and, and recognizing that this adds to the environmental perspective. I mean, for example, the environmental justice movement is fundamentally something that I call spatial justice. It has to do with location. Uh, it has to do with socially constructed industrial hazardous waste uh, production uh, as much as it has to do with any kind of natural process. And so the idea of sort of uh, adding a spatial perspective to envir the environment is a very important part of the process here. And I think it goes all the way down to the micro scale into, into building and designing as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, I think that there is, there is a degree of not only disciplinary silos, but there's a kind of you know, Leotard talked about the in incommensurability of discourse as, as being a hallmark of the postmodern. It's kind of, it, it, it's even more of a hallmark today in, in a certain perverse way uh, where, where it happens even within, um, within, you know, schools of architecture where, or even within design studio uh, programs where you have people who, you know, have one approach that's you know, utterly different than others and, and somehow they can't even meet. And although we try, you know, you try to put them to do things like put them together and teach studios and cause trouble, um, still it, it, it's a big threat. It's something that I think is crucial for architecture to take on. So I mean, you're talking very specifically about these issues of pedagogy that you wanted um, us to address. Uh, and I think that there are certain ways to address them. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, from at a, let's say, uh, at a kind of school planning level, if you if you will, there is a need to think about um, again ways ways as, as I think Alan was saying of bringing in uh, different different disciplines within within to, within programs, uh, treating you know. Uh, talking to people outside the university, I was just talking with, with uh, Robert Adam yesterday about how great it is to be at Michigan, and you know you you're able to go talk, uh, call up someone in another program, and usually they're they're pretty friendly, you know, and that that maybe doesn't happen enough, and maybe you know there needs to be, uh, I mean, not saying here, but just in uh, in schools in general, maybe we need to really take that uh, make that effort because people are, are as busy as we are, and and they might be willing to play. It might be like, oh, it's interesting. I, have, I had a good friend who was a business school in the business school at Columbia. Uh, and uh, we had incredible conversations about space uh, and, uh, and, and its role in organization and business organization. Uh, and um, he was actually a Marxist sociologist, of all oh. things, teacher at Columbia Business School, uh, working with, with, with spatial issues. Um, and um, you know, so, so there are people out there who are really interested in the kind of things we do and, and want to talk, and, and we should take, uh, take advantage of them. Uh, the the other thing is, because they don't know, uh, the, the, the about us, uh, then what we'll do. The other thing is, uh, you know, okay, when, when it would get down to then the level of, uh, you know, actual teaching, I think that there are certain things that, that might, might be useful. One is, I think that, um, first of all, grad programs, I think, are essential. I, I'm not, not to knock undergrad programs, I teach in both uh, at Columbia and also at, at an undergrad program at University of Limerick in Ireland. Uh, where in fact we've we've done that kind of disciplinary mix, but um, we it's I think it's important to think about how um, how you know we can bring in students who you know admissions committees who aren't just the traditional architects, uh, and uh, I think of like some of my best students at Columbia, uh, people who've who've come from very different backgrounds like software engineering and uh, graphic design and gone on to actually wind up being back in those fields. I mean we have this idea that we're training architects, but remember only about. 50% of these students are going to go on to be architects, uh, historically speaking. They're going to do other things. Some of them might wind up in politics, might, might wind up in urbanism, might wind up in landscape, might wind up um, running a store or becoming lawyers or something. Uh, you never know. And, and I think that, that's, that we need to, to find ways to, to imagine how an architectural education can be transformative in a positive way. Um, for those people and use them in the studio. So if I have a studio with a graphic designer and a studio with a software engineer, who later goes on to wind up working for Gary Technologies and the graphic designer winds up working for uh, 2x4, 
um, both as now with this architectural background, how can we use that in the studio? And can the studio be less a place where the instructor is just, you know, the, the design, the heroic design instructor is teaching the student, or is it a place where um, the students can begin to play other roles? Is it plausible to imagine, you know, at some level a planning studio and an architecture studio working together and mixing students? Uh, maybe not, but maybe, maybe it is. And, um, you know, <laughs> and uh, I mean, the so realities of this can be pretty different. You can about just start eating them, yeah. um, serve them for lunch. <laughs> but the idea, I think, is that, uh, you know, is it possible to think of studios as less these kind of one on one places and rather ecologies of their own and also places where you might even imagine that students begin to interact with each other and riff on each other's work? So. I mean, all that points to a, a need to change mindset um, so that mm -hmm. we're. Uh, cultivating experimentation, whether that's in the design studio, whether that's in the design practice, whether that's in the city, right? Um, that early stages of projects are really testing grounds for figuring things out so that as the project moves on, uh, uh, you can set up feedback loops, you can learn as you go. When, whenever I talk to architects, uh, uh, this kind of question arises. Uh, you know, what kind of role is uh, the designer and the architect going to play in whatever's happening? Uh, and, and the problem is that I, the, the topic for this, this session, in addition to the general topic about the future of urbanism, has to do with the relationships between city and region. And, and uh, I think the regional concept is one of the most difficult ones that architect and designers uh, have to face. They, they, they face a kind of scalar trap. Uh, the tendency is to see uh, buildings and then clusters of buildings, that becomes urban design. Uh, and then clusters of clusters of buildings become the city. And then beyond clusters of clusters of building, there's the world. Uh, and, 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 and there's a whole set of levels in between these regional scales, multiple regional scales. Metropolitan region, state, subnational region, etc. Province, national region, supranational region, EU type, you know, trading blocks. They're, and all of these are having increasing influences on local decision making, including the design process. Mm -hmm. uh, never before are these multiple levels going up to the global scale uh, having an, uh, such an influence on what happens at the at the micro scale. Uh, and so it's, it, it, it really, the, the idea of thinking regionally, whether it's spatially, geographically, but beginning to grapple with the regional concept, even more so now, if what I was saying is, is, has any substance to it, that what we're seeing is, a, is an urbanization process which is being defined regionally. We're seeing regional cities emerging, city regions emerging, uh, and that, that this is likely to be I didn't make it as a prediction, but likely to be the future of urbanism. That it's going to be a regional urbanism, a regionalized urbanism in the future. That the regional scale is going to be much more powerful and operative than ever before. And I think this is something which filters into every discipline. I mean, it's, 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 it's again transdisciplinary. The reason he invited you is because that's what Jeffrey does. Ah. <laughs> well, and, and what we will all be doing. But why actually, do you ask I the suspect. architect question? Um, we're, we're in the last moments here, and perhaps I wanted to ask one more question, but we're, we're running out of time, so perhaps we can just open it up um, so that it can infiltrate the, the rest of the sessions and perhaps the discussions over the course of the day, adding to the, the issues that have been layered into the conversation here, perhaps adding the dimension of time uh, and certainty when we use a word like design or instrumental intervention. Space time. Space time. Um, how will space time project these futures? Well, in the United States and in many places in the world, space-time represents four years of what you can do. <laughs> That's my answer. You have to design on a political calendar. <laughs> Let's assume we can imagine longer horizons than that. <laughs> Thank you very much to each of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you.